10 days. No speaking, no eye contact, no phone, no writing, waking up at 4 a.m. every day for 12 hours of meditation a day. Hey there guys, and welcome back to Unjaded Jade. So I just completed a 10 day Vipassana course. Also clock the little handheld mic. I don't think I've ever done this before, but for some reason I wanted to. I feel like I am, I don't know, hold away in my room about to pour my little heart out. It also feels weird to be speaking. I got back yesterday and I'm just, I'm not used to hearing my own voice. <laughs> it's just been me in my head, hearing the internal monologue. Honestly, this feels like a very vulnerable video and I almost didn't share anything about going to Vipassana at all. Firstly, because I was scared that I wouldn't make it the full 10 days. Um, actually, 25% of the people on the course left at some point. It was really, it was actually really jarring because you get so used to the presence of the people around you and then sometimes you come in and their meditation pillow would just be removed. And you're like, oh, it's like a squid game. Like someone's just been eliminated and you don't know why, you can't say goodbye, like they're just gone. But yes, <laughs> glad to say that I completed it. But also in these 10 days, I really went inside myself. The whole idea is that you kind of come past the conscious mind. Like after 10 days of speaking to no one, of having no input from this distracting world that we're in, what are the thoughts you're left with? What are you still thinking about? Like it's kind of getting into these subconscious thoughts that we don't even know that we have every day. And it's a little deep, so I'm a little scared, but here we are, we're gonna do it. This experience absolutely changed my life, like transformed my life in so many ways that I can't wait to talk about. It is the lightest I have felt in such a long time. I feel such a renewed sense of clarity in my purpose in this world and in many ways i think i had this spark of like who i am and who i want to be and like this this natural joy i used to have that a lot i think especially when i was you know 17 18 starting this channel or in lockdown i had this kind of spark about me but over time i've really lost it like i've, I've lost my in a zest for living and this optimism that used to come so naturally. And I think a lot of that is because I went through a really difficult time in my personal life around the end of last year and it just ravaged me. And then uni was so intense, moving countries every four months, like the attachment issues to these cities and then just being ripped away. Like it was so hard, dissertation was so hard, just so many things in life that were a lot and yeah i just was feeling not myself but i couldn't really like put a finger on it and it's weird because intellectually you know all these things that make you feel happier you know these things you should do you know these like good habits you should have and even doing those there was like this underlying sense of myself that just didn't feel grounded and now it does so i'm gonna talk about it and I was thinking that if even one person watching this video feels inspired to go and do a Vipassana course because of me and has the transformative results that I have had, then it is so worth me sharing. And I wish, I wish more people knew about it. So here we are. That's a little, a little rambly intro. So how did I hear about Vipassana? It's not your casual everyday thing people are chatting about. I first heard about it from a friend at university. She did it in the summer after first year. And I remember hearing about it and being like, is that a cult? <laughs> like 10 days of silence, that's, that's quite intense. But it's not a cult, can confirm. She was my guinea pig. Um, it's actually not attached to a religion or a sect of any kind, like anyone from any background can do it. It's also free, donation-based. It's all run by volunteers, so it's very accessible. Yeah, so she came back from that and she just said that she felt the most grounded, the most clarity she'd ever felt in her life. And I remember hearing that and being like, oh, clocked. <laughs> I should probably do this at some point in my life, but that was not going to be that year. It was not going to be second year of uni. It was not going to be third year or fourth year, but it was, it was somewhere deep, deep in the brain. And then when I went through the really tough time last year and coming into this year, 
it just felt like gut feeling this is the year this is the right time and so i put it on my new year's resolutions at some point this year i will do a vipassana course i don't know how i don't know when but it'll happen and then at the end of uni after graduation in that hectic time two of my best friends were going to a retreat in san francisco and i was a person dropping them off that day and just being around them going through their thought processes of why they were doing it in order to process university and sort of coming into the crossroads of post-grad life I realized like why am I stalling I need this too so I looked it up I looked up the retreat that my wonderful friend Leah went to and imagine this the day that I looked it up was the day that they opened the course for summer and normally it's really hard to get a place it sells out like this like you have to get it on the day and that was the day that I looked it up so I booked and got on and yeah I just feel like ah. Oh, you know, gut feeling this was this was the right time for me. There is so much to say, so get ready for a long video. I'm gonna go chronologically through the days and then talk about my general reflections and intentions coming out of it. But before we do, I am truly, truly so grateful for the sponsor of today's video. I feel like they could not be more perfect. I was lucky enough to first start meditating when I was 16, because I was introduced to it by my mum, who is a yoga teacher which made me actually grow up resenting anything to do with yoga and meditation because it's not cool when your mum does it. But I came to senses eventually. And one of the first tools I used to learn meditation was this amazing app called Headspace. Meditation can feel so overwhelming to know where to start because there's so many different types. And you're like, how do I do it? Do I just sit there and breathe? But they make it so accessible. It's this wonderful app and they have everything from sleep meditations to meditations for teenagers, meditations on stress and anxiety, visualizations visualization meditations. They also really reduce choice fatigue because they'll set you up like a daily meditation if you don't want to scroll through and choose your own. And the whole app is just so colorful and bright and light and beautiful. This app saved me during exam season, during my GCSEs and A-levels. Like every single night before I had an exam, I would do a positive visualization meditation to imagine myself in the exam hall being calm and methodical. And then every morning I would do breathing exercises to help myself feel grounded. And if it wasn't for that introduction to meditation when I was 16, I don't think I would have felt confident enough to do a Vipassana retreat now. So I'm really grateful that this app exists. And if you're interested in one day doing a meditation retreat or you've never meditated before, you want more calm, you want more clarity in your life, then definitely check out Headspace. I'm so grateful to them because with my link, you can actually try Headspace completely free for 60 days, which is amazing. You can try all the meditations, you can work it into your life in a way that feels right for you. So yeah, you can sign up with the link in the description box or use the QR code here if you're fancy and I think throughout this video you'll see how much meditation has changed my life and how much it could change yours too so yeah if you haven't meditated before definitely check it out okay so I have to turn to my trusty notebook because as soon as I came out of the retreat um, oh also you're not allowed to write like the whole time the whole 10 days so every night I was like remember what happened today Jade like I was using all I was using all the techniques I used to remember stuff for exams I was like making my visualization palaces I'm like, oh I wish I could blurt to like remember this because <laughs> I, I just really didn't want to forget so that I could talk about my experience to like my family and stuff so as soon as I got out I grabbed my notebook and brain dumped everything that I could remember from all the days. So I'm gonna let you into my diary. Very nice of me, I know. And I'm just gonna take you through the days and my thoughts and feelings and reactions throughout. Do -do -do -do. Okay, so it was in Hereford, which is an area of the UK. It's like two and a half hours from me. So I took the train to Gloucester station and then outside Gloucester station, I was gonna be picked up by a shuttle bus organized by the center and then it would take us to the center. But I didn't really know like where to wait for the shuttle bus. So I came out of Gloucester station and I was like, what now? Like slight anxiety, but I'm trying to be like Zen. There were loads of people standing outside the station, but I kind of assumed, ah, oh, you know, some people are waiting for taxis or people are waiting for friends. But then I saw this guy who wasn't on his phone. Like most people were on their phone, but he was not. And he was just kind of smiling into the distance. And he was just looking into the clouds and just smiling. And I was like, 
Now that is a meditator. Like you cannot tell me that that is just an average person here today at Gloucester Station. No, he is on the retreat. And so instantly I was like, okay, I'm in the right place. I was going on my phone and I felt really frantic, you know, saying my last goodbyes to all these people, all these friends and family, because I wasn't going to be online for 10 days. But seeing him so chilled, not on his phone, I was like, let me do that too. I was like, let me put away my phone. Let me just relax. And then sure enough, the coach arrived. I was in the right place. And actually all the people waiting outside the station were all waiting for that coach. So every single one of us was going to this retreat. And I think I was shocked by just how normal everyone was. Like people from all ethnicities, all walks of life, um, all ages, like just not, not, you know, like your stereotypical cult vibes. It's like, part of me is like oh expecting everyone to be wearing white yeah so I was one of the first people on the coach and I sat down near the front by the window and because I was one of the first almost every single person who got on was like taking another seat that was free and because I'm so extroverted and I love people I was so excited to see who would be sitting next to me because I was like oh it's gonna be the first person that I meet like one of the few people that I speak to before we go into this silence so I'm sitting there I'm like waiting for who's gonna sit next to me then it starts filling up so people are sitting next to people and then this really cool looking girl came on and she just she just looked cool and I was like oh I hope she sits next to me but then she didn't I was like that's fine and then this really gorgeous black woman with like incredible braids came on and I was like oh my god I hope she sits next to me I would love to hear her story and then she walked straight past me (laughs) it happens it's fine and then every person who came on just kept walking past my seat and so I was like oh okay I just don't look approachable it's fine like I was just overthinking everything but then towards the end this girl who just looked so young And just like also, like, it's okay that I say this, I've spoken to her, like, we're now very good friends. But she had such, like, sad energy. Like, she just looked so, like, miserable. I was like, oh my god, bless you. And she came and sat next to me. And she just was so painfully shy that I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can speak to her because I feel horrible forcing her to speak like she just looks so nervous and so then as the coach started we were both just like sitting there in silence and everyone else is like starting to talk and get to know each other and there was just like this expectant silence I was so aware of it um but I was like oh I really want to get to know her and so I was like Jade just do it just be brave like I was looking out into the into the greenery I was like Jade just do it so I was like hi what's your name and she was like Hi, I'm Alicia. And then the rest of the journey was so nice because we just slowly started to talk and get to know each other. And the reason that I bring up this moment is because this girl who just randomly sat next to me on the coach ended up being my biggest inspiration these 10 days and someone I felt so connected to without ever speaking to them that whole time. And I just feel so grateful to the universe that we happen to have that moment of contact because yeah she just absolutely revolutionized my experience so yes so yeah we're we're chatting she actually found out about Vipassana from Leah's Field Notes my friend who's another YouTuber and so we kind of bonded over that which is nice and then after about an hour we arrived into the center and It was like beautiful rolling hills of England, beautiful crops. And the centre itself was just, you know, it's a nice building. We offloaded the coach, we got our bags, we went inside and already like people were starting to be quiet. I think when you know that you're going for a silent retreat, you're like, do people actually want to talk? Like, is this a space where people can talk? So that the sort of silence was already like falling upon us, which was interesting. And then when we went in, we did registration. We went into the dining hall and just, you know, gave emergency contact, talked a bit about why we're here, any like mental health things we've been through. There were 50 women and 50 men, but then from that moment onwards, we were separated. So the women stayed with the women, the men stayed with the men. We would be in the same meditation hall, but all of our dining, all of our residence halls, all of our relaxed time, all of it was separate. Then I got given my key to the block, so I went to go find my accommodation. But before I did, I had to lock away all my tech, (laughs) my phone, like a bunch of other forbidden items, writing materials. And I just, this this was a silly move. 
I was trying to be such a minimalist that I hardly packed anything in my suitcase. And then I was like, oh, let me just put my entire backpack in the locker. Like, don't need to think about it. Don't need to think about everything that's in there. But there were so many things that I put in my backpack that I actually really needed. Like I have an electric toothbrush silly decision and I left my charger in the backpack also I left floss which shouldn't have been a big deal because I don't floss every day but just knowing that it was in the locker and I couldn't access it made me really crave this floss I left an umbrella in there and it ended up raining almost every single day surrendering that backpack I really should have should have thought more but anyway surrendered it felt so strange knowing that I would not be able to see my phone or speak to the outside world or my family for 10 days and then I got my little suitcase with all my worldly possessions for the 10 days rolled it over to the block and the way that my accommodation worked there were different ones for different age groups mine was like a long corridor hallway of this block like if you imagine a like secondary school you have like music block and stuff like it was a block and the block had just been divided into rooms with curtains so they weren't full rooms like they didn't have walls it was just curtains but I was very pleasantly surprised that we got our own space within these curtains because I've been used to having roommates my whole last four years and yeah I just was expecting more of a dorm so I really liked that you had the presence of others in the block, but you had your own space. And the girl that I sat next to on the bus, Alicia, she was also in the same block, which was really nice. And then I met this other girl who watches my videos and she had messaged me beforehand to say that she was coming. So it's really nice to meet her. And then us three went back to the dining hall for all the information. And imagine this, we sat down at a random table with this woman who was like in her sixties. And I remember her looking like kind of stern and intimidating. But I was like, it's okay, we'll just like, we'll sit there. And then I started chatting to her and I was the first person that she spoke to at the whole place because she had just been kind of like in herself. And then here I am breaking her silence, but anyway. And it turns out that she is from the tiny town in Friesland in the Netherlands where my mum is from. And it is so rare to meet people from Friesland outside of the Netherlands, or at least in my experience. And she had flown here just for this. Like she had tried to find one across the whole of Europe and this was the only one she could find. And she was just so like surprised too that I had the Dutch link. And so her English, English wasn't very good. So we were speaking some Dutch and it just felt very like warm knowing that we had this connection. She was so commendable. She was 64 and she works with victims of sexual assault, which is like such heavy work. And so part of her being there was to like cleanse that. But she was such an incredible woman and yeah so these three people and then one other girl who I met in my block briefly were the only people I spoke to before the silence began so I didn't know anyone else didn't know anyone else's stories just these three so in the dining hall we had a light dinner we had a lovely soup we had an explanation of how everything would work and then from that moment on the silence began there was no more speaking for 10 days to anyone and now we get into it closing the eyes Noticing how the body feels right now. So the daily schedule is as follows. 4am, you get a gong. Boom, gong, waking up everyone in the centre. You wake up, you can go shower, whatever, and then by 4.30, you should be in the meditation hall and you're there from 4.30am to 630 So two hours of just sitting there meditating. Then you get to go have breakfast and the food was so amazing. It was mainly vegan with like a cow's milk option if people wanted. And it was all cooked for and served by volunteers who had passed done courses and wanted to serve back for the people who had served for them. So you'd have breakfast and rest time where you could walk to this woodland space. There was like so much nature in the center. And then 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. was an hour of meditation. Then you go for a five minute break. And then 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. is two hours of meditation. So you're back in the hall. Then then you go have lunch, you get another rest break. And then at 12 till one, you can have meetings, private meetings with a teacher if you want to clarify anything about the technique or your experience. And then the afternoon begins. Imagine guys, 1 p.m. to 2.30, meditation. Five minute break. 2.30 to 3.30, meditation. Another hour, right? Five minute break. 3.30 till five meditation. So it's like an hour and a half, an hour, an hour and a half with like hardly any break. And you are just 
you're just sitting there like oh my gosh I am here in my head and I get a break and now I'm here again in my head oh brilliant <laughs> then there's no dinner and coming in I actually didn't really know that I just signed up for it not realizing that and the reason that there's no dinner, you get two pieces of fruit, that's it. And if you're a returning student, you only get lemon water. Some reasons that they say this is, is because you feel so much lighter, you're able to meditate better. You don't do any physical activity, you're not allowed to exercise because they say that strenuous exercise is a way to release your emotions and you shouldn't be like putting a band-aid on them, you should be sitting in them and processing them. So there's no physical exercise, so in a way you don't need as much sustenance. But yeah, so you're lighter, so you can kind of meditate better. Also you're going to sleep super early and waking up at 4 a.m. so you don't have to like digest as much so you can fall asleep really easily. And then also as I get more into like the technique, you're practicing observing aversion and craving in yourself and applying that to like your day-to-day -day life. And in many ways, being hungrier allows you to sit with this craving of food and to have to like, I don't know, sit with that, observe that. So that's some of the rationale. But in my experience, I actually really wasn't that hungry. Like after the first day, first day obviously is hard because you're getting into the routine. But after that, I just felt fine. Um, and almost everyone I spoke to was also fine. Someone did message on my Instagram to say that this would be hard for people who have struggled with restrictive eating in the past, which I can definitely see. So know yourself if you're gonna do an experience like this, if that's a trigger for you, then maybe don't do it. But having said that, a lot of people who come do suffer with addictions of many kinds and find that it's a helpful experience. Anyway, that was a long story, but yes. Yeah, so after dinner, you have another hour of meditation an hour and 15 of teacher's discourse, which I really look forward to every day. Everyone would come and sit in the hall and they would play this video of this incredible teacher called Goenka. He's like one of the founders of popularizing Vipassana across the world. This video is from 1991 and yet it is so relevant, so funny. Like he's just such a brilliant, wise teacher and I learned so much from these videos. So yeah, you would have your teachings and then you do another hour of meditation and you go to bed at 9 p.m. And let me tell you, every day that my head hit that pillow at 9 p.m., I was out like a light. I was absolutely exhausted. I think some people have this bias. I've had it too, this idea that meditation is relaxing and peaceful and yeah, just very chill. But this was not relaxing. You do not come to Vipassana to relax. You come here to work. Vipassana is work. So let's let's get into the rough technique. And with the next out breath, just gently closing the eyes now. So Vipassana is founded on three main core ideas called Sila, Samadhi and Panya. Sila is the idea of morality. So you can't practice Vipassana unless you do this, you take these moral precepts. So on the first day, we took the moral precepts. They're very basic, things like, I will not kill, I will not steal, I will not take intoxicants, I will not do sexual misconduct, and I will not tell lies, which is partly why there's a noble silence, because naturally we tend to exaggerate our experiences, even of the meditations, and so that just prevents you lying. You take your sila on day one, and then samadhi is this idea of focus cultivating your ability to focus on a craft. In this case, you are developing your ability to focus on your body sensations without always being lost in thought. And so you spend the first three days cultivating a strong samadhi. And let me tell you, those first three days are hellish. All you are doing for 12 hours of the day is focusing on the feeling of your breath coming in through your nostrils. Like that's it. Just focusing on the outer ring of your nostrils, the inside of your nose, and the feeling of your exhale on this little triangle of skin above your lip. And your entire attention is just focused here. You're not regulating your breath. You're not doing a breathing exercise like up and down. You are literally just watching your breath from the perspective of your nostrils. And the reason for this is it's such a small area that it sharpens your brain. Like initially you don't feel sensations on your nostrils because you're never used to doing that in day-to-day -day life. But by the third day of over 30 hours of focusing on it, you are feeling 
the most fine sensations that you can imagine. You feel the temperature of the air coming in and how it's different from the temperature of the, of the air coming out. You feel like little tingling on your nostrils. You you notice the feeling of the exhale onto your lip. So it really sharpens your mind's ability to feel your own body. And then when you cultivated your samadhi, then you can actually learn full vipassana, which is where you get into the panya. And panya means wisdom and insight and, you know, coming into your subconscious and learning about yourself, learning about the nature of consciousness, what we actually are, learning the nature of the sensations in your body. And so day four onwards is focused on panya, on wisdom. And vipassana really is nothing but a glorified body scan. If you've ever done a body scan meditation, that's kind of what vipassana is. It's like you focus on the crown of your head, you imagine the sensations right here at the top, and then you move like two inches to the left, two inches, two inches, two inches, and you just feel all the sensations here. And then you move another two inches to the crown of your head, to your forehead, to your eyebrows, to your nose, and you just deeply feel all the sensations. You feel all the sensations and you move your entire body down your back, down your front, down your arms, into the base of your trunk, down your legs all the way into your toes and then you go back up again so you're just feeling all the sensations in your body and you do that for 12 hours a day and it sounds so simple and so easy and so like it would not do anything that life-changing for you but through this teaching basically what happens is let me try explain it it's like hard when you're doing this for such a long period you start to notice sensations on every part of your body like you could tell me, oh, focus on this tiny spot on your back and I would feel it or focus on, you know, this tiny part of your eyebrow and I would be able to feel a sensation there because you're training yourself to notice all these like little vibrations, sensations everywhere in your body. And you start to realize that that is kind of just what we are. Our consciousness, our sense of self, our psychosomatic self is it's just a combination of millions of biochemical reactions happening in our body at all times. And because our conscious brain is so dominant, we are used to ignoring it day to day. We're used to like, having conversation, thinking about actual objects. So we ignore all these, these sensations. But our subconscious is always feeling them. Our subconscious is always aware of like a little itch or like, like an annoying sensation on your arm. And so you itch it without even thinking. Like that is a sensation that your subconscious has recognized that your conscious mind hasn't. And in this practice, this is how we get into the subconscious mind is we notice all the sensations that it is constantly noticing. We develop wisdom through two core ideas. The first is that Every sensation in your body, good or bad, is impermanent. If you have strong sensations of pain, no matter how painful it is, the pain is impermanent. Like at some point that pain will pass. If you feel really joyful, really happy, really pleasant sensations, at some point those sensations will pass. And once you really fundamentally understand the idea that every sensation will pass at some point, then you develop this idea of equanimity where you become neutral to all sensations that you experience, whether it's really difficult things going on in your body or you know this really enlightening, joyful sensation, you are taught to just merely observe it with equanimity. But let me tell you guys, that is so hard. Like imagine you feel this intense itching on your arm. They want you to not react to that. They want you to notice this itching is impermanent. This itching will fade. And so rather than just reacting to it subconsciously, as I always would every day, I am going to retrain the pattern of my subconscious mind by not reacting to that sensation. I will recognize this sensation is impermanent. It will pass and I will let it pass. And so the core benefit of Vipassana is that by around day seven, day eight, day nine, when you are able to sit for a full hour without moving a single inch, when you have developed this equanimity in yourself, then deep, difficult trauma, grief, pain, emotion, things that have been sitting in your subconscious for such a long time and are never processed will start to come to the surface of your body and actually 
be observed and released, provided that you remain equanimous and can see that these sensations are impermanent. So it's like you imagine you're sitting there for half an hour in total stillness. You're equanimous to the ache in your back. You're equanimous to the happiness that you feel. You're equanimous to everything. Then all of a sudden, it's, it's the most insane experience. All of a sudden, like your entire leg and hip can just enter burning pain. Like, like, literally it feels like your leg like wants to fall off like there's pain just rises and just like takes over a part of your body and what you have to do this is what the 10 days is teaching you to do every single day you're preparing for this moment is you have to be equanimous you can't move you can't you can't like move away the pain you can't change position you can't scratch it you just have to observe it and then you imagine you're doing a body scan every single hour so you're scanning your body you're feeling all these free flow of vibrations and then you hit the space where this large sensation has come up and using your awareness you like dig into the pain in a way that helps you understand it or oh, it's so hard to explain it just sounds really like hippie but that's basically what it is it's like your equanimity your neutrality to the sensation lets it be expressed and you just have to keep thinking no matter how painful it is you're just like this isn't gonna last this is impermanent this is impermanent this is impermanent I'm in total pain but that's impermanent and if you can keep saying it's impermanent if you can keep sitting in the pain every single agonizing minute at some point the pain transforms itself and it is the most insane feeling ever it's like it feels like this wave of lightness this wave of like amazing vibrations slowly taking away every inch of the pain and transforming every place where there was pain into this humming vibrating feeling and once you've done that transformation that part of your subconscious that thing that you're holding on to that difficulty in your life is also released. So that is the very non-scientific feeling idea of a pasana, which is something that you cannot understand just like intellectually. Like intellectually it sounds like, okay, that sounds really weird. But you feel it. You feel it in your body when you do this technique. You feel these sensations coming up and if you, re if you continue to be equanimous, if you let it pass, you feel yourself becoming lighter and it is grueling, it is work, it is dragging your attention every single second away from thoughts and back to your body, back to your sensations, back to like painful things or not holding on to the pleasant moments and knowing that they too can change any second because everything's impermanent. It is so hard, but that is the core of what will transform you. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. I feel like it sounds like it doesn't. <laughs> um, this one of those things you just have to do it. You really have to do it. But yeah, so I'm gonna I'm now gonna go through my days and my experience. If instead we can have a slightly more open mindset where when anger or anxiety or sadness arises in the mind, instead if we can be interested in it. More sort of curious. Okay, so the first day, the first line of my first day. Day one was a struggle, struggle all in capitals with an underlining. The 4am session for me was absolutely miserable. I could not focus at all. My brain was everywhere. My brain was everything. I was thinking about well, what I had for lunch the day before. I was thinking about my dog. I was thinking about Minerva. I was thinking about, oh God, everything. I was thinking about, oh, I wonder what the person next to me does. I was wondering about everything i started counting my breaths to see how many breaths i could focus on just my nose for before i was lost in thought and i could not do more than two breaths before being lost in thought that is how distracted my brain my brain was and that made me feel so frustrated and i realized i actually had like a lot of ego i think i had this feeling oh i'm a yogi i'm a meditator i meditate 10 minutes a day so I should be able to do this and focus. Like, why am I getting distracted every single minute? And it really made me really angry with myself, which only made me more distracted and less relaxed. And so after the morning, I went to see the teacher and just expressed how much difficulty I was in. And she was like, 
just to observe it. She's like, this is day one. You're not going to come here and just suddenly be able to focus on just your breath for hours. She's like, just do your best. Change your position every time you need to. You know, if you have an itch, itch it. If you have a thought, let it take you and then just come back the second that you notice you're, you're in thought. And that was helpful because I think I realized I had a lot of pressure that I was putting on myself for no reason. The first day too. So during one of the two hour meditation sessions, it was optional whether or not you were in the hall. You could decide to go to the hall or meditate in your room. And halfway through, I thought, well, I'm going to go meditate in my room now. And I started meditating. I got comfy. I felt like I was so deep in it. I felt like I was really like doing the hard work. I felt like, oh, it must have been about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Like, let me just peek at my clock, my physical clock. And it had been five minutes. It had literally been only five minutes. I thought I was there for like an hour and it was five minutes. So I realized it was going to be a real struggle being in my room. And I thought, let me just lie down for a few minutes, like rejuvenate. And I fell asleep. <laughs> Waking up at 4am is not it. So I was just really tired. Um, and then I woke up feeling so like not happy with myself because I was like, oh my God, Jade, you're here to meditate. And you're sleeping. So from that moment on, I decided no matter how much effort and grueling it would be, I would take every single meditation session in the hall. I would not go to my room. I'd be in the hall. Day two, I was actually very proud of my progress in the morning because I was able to do more than two breaths before getting lost in thought. The early morning session was just so much better. I could focus more. I did feel like I had got out a lot of the maniacal thinking in the first day so I was able to be more relaxed but then after lunch I came back into the hall and in front of me I had felt very lucky because right in front of me was Alicia the girl from the bar so we each had like a meditation pillow in the hall I should have said so in the hall you had your spot and you would always go there you had like thick blankets you could wrap around yourself with this comfy pillow to sit on but in front of me had been Alicia and the other girl in our block but then day two I came in and the other girl in our block, the one who watches my videos, her pillow is gone. And it just hit me. Like, I was sitting there being like, whoa. Like, can't say goodbye. Like, no explanation. She's just gone. And I get it. Like, it, this is a hard place to be. Like, it's not easy. 12 hours a day. Um, and it made me realise even on day two, how close you start to feel all these people in the room who you don't even know even if you don't speak to these 50 women you're with you get to know them in other ways like you see who decides to go to the woodland in the morning and like go for a walk you see who drinks coffee who drinks tea you see who is first to get their food and or reserve a spot and you see who is really relaxed and is at the back of the queue you see who finishes their food, who goes for seconds, who gets thirds, who carries themselves with lightness and stops to observe the plants in the forest and who stays in their room and kind of looks for me outside. Like even though you never make eye contact, you never speak to them, you really get a sense of who people are, who people are in a very intimate way and you start to like warm to them and... This girl leaving, I think, was the first trigger of me being like, wow, impermanence, everything is impermanent, and I need to have a strong resolve in being here that is independent from all these other people. Yeah. Day two, I remember I also thought that I had a breakthrough because I was focusing on my breath, and then I started, I, I was, like, bored, and so I was like, oh, maybe if I go through all these memories really intentionally like imagine myself in this scene then that's gonna be my breakthrough meditation and so I forced myself to rethink through really difficult moments of my past year which is not the right technique actually just made me very distracted and at the time I was like oh yeah this is great this is progress but looking back I wasn't processing anything I was just living in these memories in my mind um, but you know, you develop as you go through the course. And then the afternoon was much harder. I couldn't focus. I was less motivated, but I loved the discourse. The guy was 
amazing, the teacher. Oh, also something that I was reflecting on that day is how grateful I was to be doing this retreat in the UK because the type of nature felt so much like home. For example, the types of trees would be the similar to ones in the woodland where I grew up. Every morning at 4 a.m. on the grass, there would be all these little rabbits. And I had rabbits growing up. And so just seeing the rabbits was like, I don't know, very touching. And they had silver birch trees. And it, it like gave back this memory that I forgot I had of when I was about seven or eight and my dad wanted to chop down the silver birch tree that we had in the garden, which probably for some valid reason, but at seven, you don't see valid reasons. I felt so connected to this tree and I remember staging a protest to the guy. The guy came with chainsaw and I had like written all over the tree because silver birch has like papery bark. I'd written everywhere like, please don't cut this down, like don't kill me. And I'd like tied myself to this tree. Unfortunately, they did chop the tree down in the end, which is really depressing. But I think seeing these silver birch trees really rekindled this love that I have for nature and how genuinely connected I have felt to it all my life. Um, so that was just very special. And also day two, even though it was hard for people, was a sunny day and the sun just helped so much when you had nothing to do like in our breaks people would lie down in the grass and sunbathe and in general all these adults were just so childlike you know going up to flowers and just smelling them or you know looking up into the clouds and cloud watching because when you don't have a phone you don't have work there's nothing really to do and you just can be in a really unique way you don't normally see people this vulnerable in nature day three the morning was bloody hard i absolutely hated it and in general day three was just a real challenge my body was aching sitting every day for hours is not something i'm used to doing my back was falling off my legs were falling off i was moving all the time i was just in pain I was distracted i was like why am i here why am i just focusing on my nose for 12 hours a day then i was like trust the process trust the process oh yeah the teacher did one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of us which was really nice to sort of talk through our experiences oh my god this affected me so much okay so now, when I was scrolling up my water bottle waiting to go into the lunch hall, there was this beautiful monarch butterfly. And it was just like flying around me in the light. Like the light was just shining on it in the most gorgeous way. It was just flapping. And some other women stood around and were also watching this butterfly. And, and all of us, you could just tell we had such a little lightness from watching it, enjoying its life. So the butterfly landed on the floor and this one girl came stomping down the path like clearly just not in a good mood clearly so unobservant and she stood on the butterfly and all of us were watching it happen and there was like this collective gasp like even though no one was speaking everyone was like Ooh, like because also we've taken a, oh not to kill anything intentionally obviously that was the time i made eye contact because she just looked at me and i was like Oh, it was such a weird moment because also nothing happens in the day. So that felt like such drama. And then I just kind of like picked it up and like forlornly put it in the grass. I felt for some reason the whole day I felt very affected by this death of a butterfly. Oh, you just become so sensitive when you're in that place. I know it's not her fault. She also went to see the teacher. Like it's all fine. Things happen. But it was very sad. Also that afternoon was the first time I really wanted to talk and just scream. I just hated that I had not spoken for three days. I was walking in the forest and I was like, rah, 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 but I was like, I couldn't do anything. But yeah, I just felt like strangled. Day four was a pretty strong day for me. I was finally able to spend almost every hour just focused on my nose. In the teacher's discourse, they were saying that every single hour, every single moment, every second, every breath is so important for you to constantly make effort, constantly put work in to develop this samadhi, this focus, so that when you start Vipassana, you're able to actually feel sensations in your body. Like I spoke to some people at the end who had skipped a lot of meditation sessions and they, in the end, were not able to feel a lot of the free flow vibrations that they talk about because they hadn't like invested time in building this samadhi. And so... I really took it upon myself to like be in the hall early, to be 
we were really like trying and I think day four was where it was like starting to pay off it felt just less restless and day four was the day we were introduced to Panya and this idea of wisdom the idea of impermanence that I was talking about before and I believe the weather that day was trying to teach us impermanence every five minutes the weather was totally different it would hail it would be sunny then it would be cloudy then it would rain, but then it'd be a light rain, then it'd be like a rain and a sun. And you become so aware of the weather when you have nothing else to do or think about. So every break, I would go into the woodland and get soaking wet because it looked sunny and then it would start raining. One moment I was trapped in the woodland and it was started pouring and I was standing under a tree. And I had just packed so minimalistically for this retreat. This is one thing I regret is just how little I packed. I packed way too little. I only had one jumper and it was freezing. So I wore the same jumper every day for 10 days. And I didn't want to get this one ju jumper soaking wet. So I was standing there and I was getting like angry that it was raining. And I was like, how am I going to make it back without getting wet? And other people all had umbrellas or raincoats. So I, so I felt so jealous and angry at myself. And then I saw my friend Alicia from the bus. 18 year old Alicia. And she had come into the field wearing almost nothing. And she was just looking up into the sky embracing the rain with a smile and she was getting wet her hair was fully wet and she looked so content and I realized Jade your annoyance is all in your mind it's not about whether or not you get wet it's about how you deal with that and so watching her I stepped into the rain I didn't run I just walked calmly back to the back to the place I was a little bit wet but then I actually kind of enjoyed it because I embraced it and I just dried off my jumper and it was all fine um, but I really think I was starting to learn these lessons of impermanence and embracing whatever sensation is there through these moments with the weather. That day we were introduced to Vipassana. I remember it so vividly being introduced to the technique. We were sitting in the meditation hall, the voice of the teacher it's like playing through the audio, you know, bring your attention to the top of your head. It was all very dramatic. And then all of a sudden, there's like this thunderstorm, like the thunder is crackling as they're giving the instructions and talking about, you know, you should be feeling this like flow through your body and then the rain is slashing down. And it just felt so dramatic. It felt like the weather was a paid actor to support the intensity at the moment. And after doing the technique for the first time, the body scan, I was absolutely battered. I was so exhausted. I wanted to fall asleep that second, but waited until 9 p.m., absolutely fell asleep in half a second. And then the next day, day five, was the first full day of only doing Vipassana. And it ravaged me. Vipassana is so exhausting on your mind and you know, and your body because you're also learning to sit in the discomfort of difficult physical sensations. So I went to see the teacher and I told her, I was like, am I meant to feel this exhausted? Am I meant to feel absolutely mentally ravaged every single time I do this technique? And I swear, the teachers have like five things they say. It's like, oh, just observe it. Like, I am observing it. Um, like, they never really tell you what you want to hear, but they are good teachers because you just need, you need someone to have the discipline to just tell you to like suck it up like looking back of course I was going to find it hard right but perfectionism made me want to think that I could find it easy she recommended that whenever I felt drowsy I should walk outside the meditation hall for about five minutes get fresh air and come straight back and jump back in again rather than going to my room or rather than sleeping more just jolt awake come back and keep bringing your attention back to the body and looking back it was good advice day six after day five where I literally wanted to go home I hated the technique and I felt exhausted day six was my saving grace this was a strong day for me this was the first day where I had successfully sat for an hour without moving a single muscle my equanimity was developing which is this idea of viewing all sensations in your body neutrally whether they're positive or bad the weather was miserable but I didn't mind I actually realized maybe my favorite state to do meditation in was when it was raining because it was cooler the air was just nicer to breathe and I loved the sound of the rain on the meditation hall it just felt like so inside myself there's like this white noise around it was it was really nice and then I had this 
breakthrough in the 1pm meditation session about self-abandonment. I realised in my one hour of sitting absolutely still, as some other people around me were starting to leave, they were sort of giving up or going to their room to meditate there, I felt such a craving to join them. I felt this craving to like also abandon the sensations I was feeling and just like give up and go back to my room. Even though I had really resolved to myself that I wanted to stay, just other people doing it really made me want to follow them. And I suddenly had this like flood of memories of moments where I just went along with what everyone else around me wanted and how I have just really developed a habit, a way of being where I don't prioritize myself and what I want and what I think. I'm so quick to help others and to kind of people please and, you know, like, oh, like things like going out when I don't really want to go out or um, doing things for people that maybe I don't actually have the time for doing, but I've just for some reason say yes I have learned to abandon what I intrinsically think or believe and that has had such a knock-on effect on my confidence and my sense of self and where I seek validation it's like I have learned to be validated by the opinions of others rather than myself and what I think of me and I just felt all of that in that moment and it was like as this was coming up the pain in my legs was absolutely unbearable it was like every single minute felt like an hour but I just felt like I will not leave I will not get up I will not abandon myself this time I will not like do away with this pain to be dealt with at some point I will sit in this pain I will sit in this feeling I will heal this part of myself that keeps abandoning myself and because it was an hour and a half session I sat there for the entirety of it and about half an hour later from that moment Half an hour excruciating minutes later, may I say. I felt the tingling coming up my calf of this like healing sensation that just transformed all the pain I was in. And then tears just like gently fell from my eyes because it felt like I'm not abandoning myself. Not this time, not anymore. Yeah, and it's like you can know these things, right? You can know you abandon yourself in these moments. You can know that other people control you in these moments. But it is a different thing to feel the solution. And in that moment, I felt the solution. The sun came out that evening, and for some reason, the song that came in my head as I was skipping along through the woods was the song from primary school called Autumn Days. Like, Autumn Days. The grass is green and the silk inside of the chestnut shell. And I had found these chestnut shells. Um, there's like acorns and stuff. And I was like stroking the silk of it. And I just saw it like a little child. And in general, like, guys, when you don't have a phone, you become so inquisitive about nature. You can't look up things. And so you just learn to make hypotheses about why things are the way they are. Like, why does this tree bark have all these eye-shaped marks? And over the days, I kept questioning that to myself. And I realized, oh my gosh, it's because every time a branch falls off, it forms the shape of an eye. Like you end up with all these eye shapes because these used to be branches. Or I was just exploring some of the trees. And I realized that these are cherry trees. And these are cherries and I've never known how cherries grow, which is so silly but I just have never seen them on a tree or I found these caterpillars that only had legs at the front and the back and the caterpillars were able to spin webs similar to spiders I was like whoa I've never seen that before and every single day I would come back to the caterpillars and just observe them and and like guess why they would do things like why do they need this web why do they live right at the end of the branch. And I felt like, wow, this is what it means to be a scientist or to be a biologist, is to just be curious and observe and have questions that aren't just answered for you like that. And to come up with the answers yourself. Yeah, I think we all became like biologists <laughs> in this time. Also, the last book I read before going in there was Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a book all about indigenous wisdom on nature. 
And so I think I was very biased to feel especially grateful for nature and connected to it. Oh, day seven. I titled it Equanimity. I think equanimity. Mm -hmm. I was angry this day. I was so angry. I could not, could not bring myself to be neutral to any sensations I was feeling. Pain, I hated it. I was so averse. I wanted to like punch it out of myself. I wanted to move. I wanted to like run. When I was walking in the woodland, I wanted to like scream. I wanted to move more. I was like, why am I not allowed to do exercise? I like I wanted to like, oh, just do anything. I was stomping around. I put my hood up because I was like, I don't want anyone to like come near me or like sit next to me in the dining hall. I just felt awful. I felt like I wanted to leave. I hated it there. I just hated the concepts. I, looking back, I'm like, I was literally a product of the things that they're teaching. Like, I don't know, like that. One of the main teachings is about aversion and craving in our lives and how any negative sensations we become so averse to, we become so angry, so irritated at rather than being neutral to them and letting them pass. Or when we have these really positive sensations or this happiness, we really crave that when it's gone. We want that to last. And I was craving not to be feeling this awful negativity that I was feeling. I was not allowing myself to be neutral with it, which meant that it couldn't pass. And so I went to see the teacher and I had questions for her. I was like, mm, I don't believe in equanimity. I think it's stupid. I, yeah. I was like, what about in life when you want to make things better? Like, you know being neutral to that like how's that how's that gonna help like if something's going wrong surely it's great to be like I want to change this like if I'm feeling bad I don't want to be equanimous I want to feel better like I want to change that state everything she said just angered me more so I was just in this state for when the bell went and I had to sit there for another four hours of meditation obviously I went and I sat in my anger and just as every other sensation, it passed. It was impermanent. But the difference is rather than just me running and like running away or running, going for a run round and releasing that state, I had to see it. I had to sit in it. I had to feel the rising pain of sensations in my body that represented whatever this anger was in me. And then I actually processed it. And I think this anger was just representative of things, moments in my life where I haven't let myself be angry for fear of being judged, for fear of many things. Me being angry was so necessary. Like I then I, I came away feeling so much lighter. Um so even those really negative days of Vipassana might actually be your biggest teachers. You don't know yet. You just have to you have to persist. You have to keep working. Don't run from it. Like I could have avoided going to the sessions. But I was like, no, Jane, I'm going to go. Oh my God, guys. Day eight. Day eight. They say day eight and day nine are the deepest days because they're the last few days you have to really work and you're, you're really established in the technique, you understand all the theory too, so you can just start to like really process things in your life. And I was doing that most of the day until I sat on an anthill in the break. It was really sunny. Finally, it was raining all day and there was a bench. And I remember these two women were sitting on the bench and I was looking at them and I was like kind of jealous. So I would really love to sit on that bench in the sun went to the toilet, came back, and they were gone. And I was like, brilliant, let me go sit on the bench. And so I laid back and I was stretching because you just get crumpled sitting all day. Stretching, looking at the sky, embracing the sun. I started to feel this itching on my legs, but I have spent the last five days cultivating equanimity. So I'm able to ignore an itch. You know, if I've got an itch, I'm like, oh, it's impermanent. I'll let it be. I got another itch on my leg and I was like, oh, it's impermanent, let it be. But then I looked down and my entire legs were covered in hundreds of ants. Like ants just 
crawling up my body. I I was literally like my eyes were widened. And I looked up and this woman had walked past and she looked down at me and we kind of made eye contact, which I'm not meant to do, but hey ho. We looked at each other and we were just like, oh. and I was like, Jean, can be the convert, can be the convert. And also, I'm not allowed to kill anything. So I'm like, how do I get all these ants off of me without killing them? So I'm like, trying to swipe them off. And then the gong went and I had to be back in the meditation hall. So I'm like, oh my God, Jade, be quick, be quick. Like, get rid of them, get rid of them. And then I was like, oh my God, do I have time to change my trousers? But I didn't. So I was like trying to get rid of every single one. Went to the meditation hall. And that was the hardest session I've ever done in my entire life. Because I had to sit totally still. It was the sitting of strong determination where you sit and every person in the room does not move an inch. And I felt rolling amps through my entire body it was horrible imagine you feel in your face this like cooling sensation and at the end I'd like swipe and it was literally an ant on my face oh it was it was the worst thing ever I think the universe really said you're getting too good at equanimity you're getting too good at meditation and we need to challenge you because that was a challenge and the session after even though I had got rid of every ant I'd taken a shower my body remembered the itching. It was like such a version. And so I was sitting there and I would just feel like my whole body hated me. And I realized that that was me. That was the practice for the day of me. That was that was the sensation I had to deal with that day was learning how to not itch and itch, how to really truly be fine with this feeling. And I came away from day eight feeling so proud of myself and feeling so like I really worked through a lot of things. It was just, oh my God, that was so hard. We're getting there, guys. So day nine was the reason that I came to my Vipassana retreat. Day nine was everything for me. It was one of the best days of my life. One of the hardest days of my life, but one of the best days of my life. It was pouring with rain the entire, entire day. It slashed down. The sky was dark. In the meditation hall, every single second was just pouring rain. And yet I felt such bliss. I felt more bliss than I have felt in years. Like I was just pure bliss. And they had this idea in the teachings where if you, you know, if you work hard enough, if you feel your sensations enough, if you embrace the technique enough, that at some point you might be able to feel this free flow of sensations where from your scanning from the top to the toes to the toes to the top and you can just feel your body as a mass of vibrations and I was able to access this on day nine and I just felt like my entire body was ah oh, so light I cannot describe that feeling it was and that was the day where I received a lot of insights about myself and my life and who I am and who I want to be in this world. I'm not going to share all of them because some of them are quite personal, but a few things was I realized I have become incredibly self-centered and just egoistic in the way that I live my life, not in an extreme way, like I still love who I am, you know, but throughout university, I was so focused on myself and my goals and YouTube even it's become so much less about me serving people and you know like connecting with people and helping people in many ways it has become a job and become something that I just you know I had no time at uni so I was like just make a video Jay like churning out editing stressfully editing all the time and just like it was just stressful but it was not rooted in this deep sense of purpose that I used to have and even I used to volunteer all the time I used to do things for people all the time and even though, yes, you know, like life goes through phases, you have moments where you can do things for others and moments where you have to prioritize yourself. I felt like so much of my joy comes from helping people and I need to do that more. I need to do that more with my finances. I need to do it more with my platforms. I need to do it more with my free time and my personal life and volunteer more. I just need to be more of a conduit of service. Yeah, that's just... I just know that for a fact. I don't want to work a job that is not helping people. I don't want to have a channel that it doesn't feel rooted in service. And I don't want to live a life that is just for me. So, yeah.
that's one really nice styling and then I also felt this like deep calling to create something that I don't want to say yet because I don't know saying it feels like pressure or like I don't know you just don't share all your goals you know um yeah I just I realized like why am I chasing the same things as friends why am I looking for jobs that my friends are looking for? Like, there's this thing that I really, really want to do that I just have not even considered as an option for myself. But I felt this, like, deep gut feeling that, yeah, I would love to do that. So I think I'm going to try and do it. Uh, so that's one. I had some amazing insights about my love life and what I want from it and who I want to be around. And I just really feel like that day, my whole body embodied self-love and self-understanding and even every single deep pain that would come up I treated with such love such equanimity like my whole lower half would be in like burning pain and I just felt so much love for it because I was like this is me processing things for the good of myself this is me you know taking the time taking the mental effort and it's strength to go through things that have really been difficult and I just felt yeah so light and so loved by me and then finally day 10 they call day 10 soothing the balm of the wound because in many ways Vipassana they call it like doing brain surgery on yourself like there's no surgeon giving you anesthetic like it's just you you are the surgeon you do the work you go through the pain you feel it all you do everything you're the patient and the medic. So yeah, you need a day before going into the real world to like attempt to heal back up the wounds. Early morning, 4am was still Vipassana. I went, I did my session, moved through some things, feeling so light, feeling so like good in the technique. And then we learned meta meditation, which I've done before. Meta is like loving kindness, compassion meditation. It's another Buddhist technique. It's where you send good energy to a certain person or all people and you just imagine yourself as really full of love and full of light and you just wish well for everyone. People who have harmed you, you feel compassion for, which is tough. People who have wronged you, you try and forgive. You forgive yourself for all the harm that you have caused. You just put yourself in this really positive vibration state of love and good energy. And it's so much easier to access when you're doing it with a hundred other people who are all channeling that really good energy and warmth for you too. And in that session, all the servers, the volunteers came and sat and did the meditation with us. And these volunteers, they cooked for us, they cleaned for us, they like helped organize everything they helped organize the teaching and I was overcome with such deep gratitude for these people like it's such an intimate experience of Pasana you know like you're going through so much hardship and so when you see these like warm smiling faces at lunchtime and you just know that these people are only here to cook for you to help you I just felt so, so grateful and I started sobbing during this meta meditation. Like tears were just streaming from my eyes and Gawenka, the teacher, he was saying, you are so lucky to be human because only humans get to practice things like Vipassana where you're able to have such metacognition about yourself and who you are. Like you are lucky to be human. You are lucky to be alive. You are lucky to be here today. And I just felt it, like, thank whatever biology, universe, God, whatever, thank them, thank this, that I am me. I really, really felt that in that moment. And I just wish with every atom of my being that all humans could feel as liberated as we did in that moment. Um, like, we all go through such struggles, we all have such hardship, and... It is not easy to be happy, unfortunately. This world makes it very difficult. And I just really wish in that moment, like, wish liberation for everyone. And then after that meditation, we got to break the noble silence. And I came out of the hall. 
and Alicia was there. And me and Alicia the whole time had had this like unspoken support of one another. We were always the first people in the meditation hall at 4 a.m. We were oh, sometimes the only people coming every time. We would, I just noticed we would always get like the same tea. We had such a similar routine. We always go to the woodland at the same times. Like she just was such an inspiration and companion and point of strength on days where I didn't want to meditate. Like she was always there. She was always equanimous. And so coming out of it, both of us, we we came outside the meditation hall and they said, you can break the silence. And we just walked in silence next to each other. I was, tears were streaming down my face. I hadn't even heard my voice in 10 days, you know? And then I just turned and I looked at her, I made eye contact. She was like, are you okay? And I was like, and then we hugged. And it just felt so... I felt like time stopped. You haven't, like, touched a human, spoken to a human, spoken to yourself, spoken to, like, anyone. You've just been in your mind for so long. And then to for this person who's been through the exact same experience who has, like, helped you, you helped them in an unspoken way, in a very intimate way. Like, it just... It was so impactful. And, yeah, we hugged. And then it was just... Like, I don't know what to say. What do you say? I was like, how was your 10 days? And she's like, a roller coaster. Like, how was yours? I was like, yeah, me too. Um, and the weather was so fitting. It was like raining, but the sun was shining on it. Like pure, beautiful, shining droplets. It was like morning dew, but like coming from the sky with all the sunlight. It was amazing. And then slowly that day, we got to chat to everyone, got to sit and hear all these people's stories. I heard from the Dutch woman again, how she found it. Other people who I'd felt so close to the whole time without ever speaking to them, I finally got to know them. But also my social battery was done like that. Like after speaking to a few people, I felt so exhausted. I felt like I was going to lose my voice. I felt like, like every, I don't know, if someone said something even slightly negative, I would feel in my whole body, my whole chest, how it affected me. Like, you just became so aware of your body sensations in the most, like, empowering way. Because you're like, I, am just, I understand this form that I am in. That day was just amazing. And it was so weird, like, being in the block and all these people. You got to know, like, after 10 days, you're very aware of who lives with you. And, you know, you're brushing your teeth in silence together every night. And so... Being able to brush our teeth together and talk was amazing. Being able to hear the stories, amazing. Going to the woodland and saying, you know, this tree was my favorite tree. And she's like, oh my God, no way. Like this piece of moss here, I've looked at every single day. And I was like, no way. Like, did you notice this, this flower crown someone left? And she's like, oh, I made that. You know, like, oh, it's so cool. Cause it's like all these hidden secrets that you've had, you get to share. And then the next day, after another meta meditation where we sent this, you know, compassion and good energy to the world, which made me cry again, I cleared up everything, cleaned the whole place with the other other people and volunteers and got on the train home. The second I saw my my family, I sobbed. The first song that I heard after ten days, I was sobbing. I went I went for a walk around my area and I felt like I saw every tree, every bit of the road, everything with eyes I have never had before, an awareness I've never had before. I just feel like a new person and I know it sounds so dramatic and it's I think this whole experience is like it's just hard to like understand unless you've done it. That's also annoying, but yeah, I hope I don't just come across like some weird hippie colored girl, but it was just really, really transformative. And I think has, it has just given me a lightness, given me a version of myself that I've really been craving. But more than anything, it has given me a technique, Vipassana, which I'm going to practice every day. For like as many times as I can in my life, like 
I right now I've been meditating an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, and I'd love to do at least an hour a day. But this technique, guys, you need to do it. You need to do it. Like other meditation types are amazing, but this one is so holistic, getting you in your body sensations and helping you understand the way you react to challenges in your life. I feel so, 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 so grateful. Yes, if you made it to this point in the video, that is so impressive, honestly. If you got to this point, please comment my favourite emoji, which is the butterfly emoji, and I will do my best to reply to every single one that I see. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being in my little corner of the internet. Truly, from the bottom of my heart, gut, mind, like, it is so crazy to me that we've been connected in this way, and... I just feel so, so grateful for this life. And if you ever get the chance to do a Vipassana retreat, please seize it with open arms, but also please be ready because it is so much work. And a lot of people leave, which is sad. And um, yeah, just like know what you're getting yourself into, but also do it. Don't hesitate, do it. I'll leave all the links that you would need in the description and message me if you ever do go. I would love to hear your experience. Oh my God, my camera overheated and died. So <laughs> I just wanted to say a little goodbye. Um...